Have you ever noticed that certain holidays have weird habits attached to them? Here's what I mean. Think about it. All year we tell kids to stay away from candy and it's bad. And then on one night, we tell kids to go and get as much candy as they can. And where are they supposed to get that candy from? Strangers. <laughs> Weird habit. Another one. Christmas. We celebrate Christmas. It's Jesus' birthday. Usually, normally, at a birthday celebration, you bring presents to someone. Not us. Christmas, it's, what present do I get for Jesus' birthday? Weird habit. And then we have New Year's. This is one of the weirdest habits. We start off this new year, and we reevaluate the year before, and we identify all the things that we have screwed up in and say, I want to change that. Now, that's a real positive way to start 2016. But as we do that, did you know that 45% of Americans over the last three days have made New Year's resolutions? It's a wonderful time just to stop and evaluate where we're at in life. And the reason why this is so important is because we can identify some of those areas where it's like, I need to grow in this or I need to grow in that. And so because of this season, we wanted to do a five-part series entitled Intentional Living. During this series, we're going to be looking at five areas of our lives where we can be intentionally living in 2016. Because when we start 2017, we want to look back over, over our lives and see that in these five areas, we have grown in 2016. And the first area that we're going to be looking at today is intentional growth. And intentional growth has everything to do with how are we doing in growing in our relationship with God. Because growth is not a given. Let me say that again. Growth is not a given. Here's what I mean. In Hebrews 5, the author is talking to a group of people that know Jesus. And he says, you've been walking with God for so long now. You should be teaching others. But instead, people need to be teaching you because you're not intentionally growing. And we know this to be true in other relationships. Think about that best friend you had when you were growing up, or maybe in college, and you were going to be best buddies forever. But then something happened, maybe they moved or you moved, and the relationship slowly kind of started to crumble. It's not because you didn't love the person anymore. You weren't intentional about the relationship any longer. And sadly, this even slips into some of our marriages where we start off and we have these great intentions of this being the most wonderful relationship that I'll ever have, but then what happens? Life happens. And we stop being intentional with our spouse. And because of that, the relationship can slowly start to crumble. Any relationship, if it's going to grow, there has to be intentionality behind it. And that's the exact same way with our relationship with God. So this morning, I want to encourage you, as we start 2016, to be intentional in your growth with God. Because every minute that you invest in that relationship is a minute more that you are going to know the creator of the universe more and you will experience the full life that he promised. It's one of the greatest relationships you can ever invest in. But you have to be intentional about it. And our word picture for this morning is simply of a plant. I think a plant really represents kind of how our relationship with God can work. And a plant needs four things to grow. It needs water. It needs air sunlight, and nutrients. When all four of these things are present, growth naturally occurs in the life of a plant. And a plant has three life cycles. Here's what they are. The first one is dying. I am really good at this cycle. Give me a plant and I'll do it. Very short story. This has nothing to do with anything, but I want to share it. These people had me house sit for them for just like five days. And the main thing that I had to take care of was the plants. When I got there, they looked immaculate. They said, you got to do this, this, and this. I did it to the T. I practically killed them all in five days. I don't get it. I'm horrible at it. So this is my specialty right here, all right? Dying. The next stage is surviving. This is where plants, they're green, but they're not really living the full life that they were created to live. And then finally, we have thriving. Dying, surviving, thriving. So as we think about 2015, I want you to ask yourself this question. If your relationship with God was represented by a plant, what stage would best describe your relationship with God in 2015? Here's the three stages. I intentionally want you to pick one. If you had to think about 2015 in your relationship with God, where would it be? Dying? 
surviving or thriving. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is when it says, I forget what is behind, I press on towards what is ahead. Guess what? 2016 is a new year. And I have a new question for you. And my question is this. If your relationship with God could be represented by a plant again, what stage would best describe your relationship with God for 2016? I don't care what 2015 was. What do you want for 2016? Specifically pick one. A dying relationship with him? A surviving relationship with him? Or a thriving relationship with him? Because I have great news. If this describes 2015 for you, that one over there can describe 2016. But you have to remember, growth is not a given. Growth happens when we are intentional about growing in our relationship with God. You've maybe been a Christian your whole life, and 2015 could be described by this because you were not intentional in that growth. Or maybe it could be described by thriving because you were intentional. So even if you were here in 2015, you can be thriving in 2016. And I have a great story that I want to share with you that represents this. A family found out that they were pregnant. And this family had a long line of religious heritage. A lot of people knew who they were based on their heritage. And when they found out that they had a boy, there was only one name that this boy had to have. And it was a name that when anybody would even say the name, they would think of the religious heritage of this family. Because this family had high hopes for this boy. That he would carry on this long line of religious heritage that they were so proud of. Well, as he started to grow, they brought him to the religious classes and the religious gatherings that they were accustomed to going to. But as he was sitting in these gatherings, something didn't really click. For some reason, he never really understood what was going on, and he wasn't all excited about it like his parents were. And so as a result, when he was in his teenage years, he made a very strategic decision. He said, I'm done with it. I'm done with this religion. And I'm going to turn my back, and I'm actually going to adopt a brand new lifestyle with new friends and a new job. He made a whole lot more money than he was before. But with what he was doing, people didn't really like him. But he was okay with that because, hey, you can buy friends. So as he was living this new lifestyle and he had these new friends, one day, somebody came up to him and gave him an intentional invitation grow in his relationship with God. The man I'm talking to you about right now, you might know him as Levi or Matthew. Levi or Matthew represented a man that probably had the religious heritage of the Levites. Now the Levites were a very specific tribe in the nation of Israel. The Levites didn't get any land from God. Their inheritance was that God said, you're going to take care of the temple, you're going to serve at the temple, and you're going to maintain the temple. That is your heritage. That's what you get to do. And more than likely, this boy was born, and his parents were Levites. And they had high hopes that he would serve in the temple and maybe even be a priest one day. But we find out that it never really clicked, you could say. In fact, to say it plainly, He was a dropout, spiritually. He was probably very far from God. His relationship with God was definitely characterized by dying or dead. We know this because he wasn't just not serving in the temple. He was doing the exact opposite. He was collecting taxes for Rome. Rome was the governing authority at the time, and they needed people to collect taxes. And instead of sending Roman citizens to try to collect taxes, because nobody likes to pay taxes, and if you do, you're weird, okay? I'm just throwing that out there. They said, we're not going to send Roman citizens because they're just going to get mad at them. Instead, let's just make an offer to some Jews and give them enough money so that they'll basically sell out and they will go and collect taxes for Rome. And one of those sellouts was Levi. He was so happy. He made so much money. But in that, he turned his back on the nation. But he didn't care. 
So this is where we pick up our story. This dropout deadbeat gets an invitation one day. And here's what it says. It says, as he, talking about Jesus here, walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. First thing, Levi was just sitting at his booth, making money what he was doing. And then out of nowhere, he's given an invitation to be a disciple of Jesus. Now, in the first century, you've got to understand this. When you were someone's disciple, this wasn't just showing up to a religious gathering once a week. You committed your life to that teacher or that rabbi's teaching, and their authority was over you. And Levi was probably very familiar with this because when he was growing up, his parents probably wanted, to, wanted him to be a disciple of one of the rabbis, but he never did. So he understood this. So when he is serving Rome and has turned his back on God, he gets this invitation. There is a lot hanging in the balance in this moment. Because on one hand, if Levi stays at his tax collector's booth, he's guaranteed a life of comfort, security, and he would probably eventually die very happy and wealthy with a nice house. And he'd probably experience some perks from Rome along the way because that's who he worked for. That's what was on one side of it. The other side of it was he could follow Jesus, and he didn't know this, but he would walk with him. He would see him after he was raised from the dead. He would see Jesus ascend into heaven. He would be filled with the Holy Spirit. He would write an account of the, of the life of Jesus that we are still reading to this day. And eventually he would die a martyr in Ethiopia. This is hanging in the balance from this one invitation. Make no mistake about it, my friends. If you're going to grow in your relationship with God, it's intentional. It doesn't just happen. And that's what's hanging in the balance right now for him. This was his response. 14b, he says, So Levi got up, and he followed him. Now, when we read this, normally we just think two things happen. Or just one thing happens that he just followed Jesus. No, no. two things happen. The first thing he did was he got up. When he did this, he was signifying that I am leaving my life as a tax collector, and now I am going to follow Jesus. And this is very appropriate, especially as we're looking at New Year's resolutions for 2016. We have a lot of high hopes of pursuing and following new things. I actually researched it, and I found out that some of the top New Year's resolutions that are broken are getting out of debt, eating healthy, and the last one is being more financially fit, saving more money. Those are the three that are most commonly broken. Here's why. We don't understand that we need to leave in order to follow. Let's say you want to be financially fit. The problem is you're not willing to leave the Twinkie on the shelf. And because of that, you can never follow through and be, and be physically fit. Another one, it would be getting rid of bad habits. Drinking, smoking, whatever you want it to be. You don't want to give up the feeling in order to follow through with a better lifestyle. You don't want to leave so you can follow. And one of the best ones of all, you don't want to give up that item that was on sale. I mean, it was 70% off. They were practically giving it away. And so what do you do? You spend money that you don't have, and as a result, you can never follow through and be financially healthy. If you're going to follow something new, you have to leave something behind. That's the way it works. And that's why so many New Year's resolutions are broken, no matter what they are. Because we have established patterns in our lives. And because of that, we have to leave something. And we don't want to. So instead of following through with that new thing, we stay with what we have. And we come to the end of the next year and we say, oh, you know, I'm really going to try harder this year. But the problem is, you never left in order to follow. I'm not saying that if you want to follow Jesus, you need to quit your career and everything else. But I am saying 
you need to be intentional of saying, I'm going to follow him, and as a result, these things that are getting in the way of me following him, yes, I need to be willing to let those go if I need to. Because you can't follow until you leave. And so I share that with you because he makes the intentional decision to follow after Jesus. And the first thing that he does after he makes this decision, it's going to sound crazy, he starts a growth group. He starts a growth group. Now, he didn't call them that at that time, but that was the first thing that he did to intentionally follow after Jesus. Because a growth group is simply this. A growth group is where you grab material, you gather with at least one other, pe- one other person, all the way up to 13 people, and then you grow in your relationship with God and others. This is what a growth group does. Grab, gather, grow. Grab, gather, grow. And this is exactly what Levi did, because check out the next verse, right after he decides to follow Jesus. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other sinners. What did he do? He grabbed Jesus. Now, none of the material that we would provide for you or that you can find is going to be as good as having Jesus right there with you. Just throwing that out there right now. But he grabbed Jesus. Second, what did he do? He gathered sinners. I love this. He gathered the other screw-ups that he did normal life with. He wasn't like, oh, now I better go find some really religious people to start my group. No. He invited the people he did everyday life with. And then what did they do? They had dinner, and they grew together. He started a growth group. And so as they're having this growth party, unfortunately, some party crashers showed up. And every good party has party crashers, because if you don't have anyone crashing your party, it's probably not that good. I'm just letting you know. All right? So, same party. We have some crashers show up, and here's who they are. But when the teachers of the religious law who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners. They asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? Party crasher alert, they're here. The Pharisees show up. And the Pharisees, these were the most religious and holy people of the first century. If anyone was probably the closest to God based on what they did, it would be these people. And so they see what's going on, and it makes absolutely no sense to them. Because if you are holy and you're so perfect, you should only be hanging out with other holy and perfect people. So if Jesus wants to be so holy, why in the world is he with this scum? And the reason why this is so important in the story is because whenever we intentionally want to grow in our relationship with God, I believe we all have an inner inner Pharisee talking in our ear. They say something like this. You know what? You've tried that before, and you failed. You'll never be as holy as that person. Or do you know how many times you have screwed up? Don't even try. Because we all hold up this standard in our head that if we're going to be really close to God, we've got to do all of these things. And so we keep hearing that voice over and over again. And for most of us, we decide, you know what? It's not even worth it. So we don't even try anymore. Because the Pharisee in our head is too loud. But here's what I love. Jesus answers these Pharisees very directly. And it helps us to understand how we should be answering the inner Pharisees that we have in our own head about intentionally growing in our relationship with God. Here's what Jesus says. When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but to those who know they are sinners. The first word picture that Jesus gives everyone, he says, I'm a doctor. Doctors are here for sick people. I have never known anyone that says on Friday night, hey, what do you want to go do? Let's go to the doctor's office. Let's do that. That's going to be great. If you're a doctor, no offense, you're not that fun. I only go because I'm sick, all right? We get this, but we don't get this. Because when we screw up and we drop out 
quote-unquote, of our relationship with God. We think, oh, God would never love me. I'm sick. I need to get myself healthy before I show up to the doctor. Don't waste your time. Go to the doctor. He will take care of you. That's the first word picture he uses. And then he says, hey, in case you missed it, I'm just going to let you know, I didn't come for people who think they're righteous, who think they have it all together. I don't even have time for them. I am here specifically for the sinners, the screw-ups and the dropouts. That's who I'm here for. I love this, but we miss this. Because for some of you, you probably haven't been to church for weeks, months, maybe even years, and you're like, oh, I don't know if I should go. I haven't been for so long. I hope no one recognizes me. It's just, it's going to be awkward. No, this is why we're here. We are here for you. Because that's who Jesus came for. Because I am a living testimony that God can take a sinner and a screw-up and a dropout and can change him and turn him around. And if you want to hear more of my story, I would encourage you to come up to me after, and I'd love to share some of it with you. But no, if you're not holy and you're not righteous, you're in the perfect spot. If you are holy and you are righteous, go find a different church maybe. I don't know, because we can't help you much. We do much better with the screw-ups around here. I'm just letting you know. That's why they hired me. We get this. Because that's why Jesus came. He came for the screw-ups and for the sinners. So as you look at 2016, what do you want your relationship with God to look like? If you have been here your whole life, it's no big deal. Because God came. God sent his son Jesus for you and for me. But we have to be intentional about this so we can actually go from dying to thriving if we're intentional about this because growth is not a given. But just like normal plants, remember, normal plants need intentional things to grow. Here's the things that they need. They need air, water, sunlight, and nutrients to grow. A plant grows based on very intentional processes that God has set up. You take a plant, you put it indoors. If you don't do these things intentionally, they will die. That's what naturally happens. A plant naturally doesn't grow by itself when it's brought indoors. It has to be intentional. It's the same way in our relationship with God. And so if you want to spiritually grow this year, here's four things that you need to do to grow. And these blanks are on the handout in your bulletin. I wanted to start off 2016 on a very positive note, so I gave you the answers right after the statements just to make sure you got them, okay? But for you note-takers, I, I still got to fill in the blank. I got to fill it in. I'm going to fill it in. I'm going to fill it in. Here you go. Here's what you need to do. You need to be listening to God's word. That's the first thing you need to do. Second, you need to be speaking to him through prayer. Third, you need to be having relationships with other Jesus followers. And then once you're doing these three things, God is going to show up in different ways, whether through your reading or your praying or someone speaking into your life, and there's going to be next steps where you're going to sense God prompting you to take a step forward in your relationship with him some way, somehow. When he does that, we take those next steps. But make no mistake about it. Growth is not a given. All four of these things are intentional. They will not just naturally fall into your lap. You have to be intentional about growing in them. And I didn't want to just give you to these and say, hey, good luck in 2016. I wanted to give you some actual resources that can help you. So here you go. For listening to God, one of the best apps that I would encourage you to download, it's called YouVersion. If you have a smartphone, search your app store, just type in YouVersion, download the Bible app that comes up. This thing is wonderful. There's reading plans, there's topic plans. If you're struggling with something very specific, there's probably a reading plan for that. You can read through the Bible in a year. This thing even reads the Bible to you. This is a wonderful opportunity that anywhere that you are, you can have the Bible accessible to you and even have it read, read to you if you'd like. The other one is our daily bread. Once a quarter, we provide those here. They're simple reading plans where basically you get a passage for the day, you read the passage, and then there's a paragraph or two kind of highlighting how that passage applies to what we're doing in our everyday lives. 
Those are two great resources that you can use. Our Daily Bread even has an app if you want to search that. But this, these are great ways that you can be listening to God's word. Next, speaking to him. The more specific you can be in your prayer, the better. Because many times, here's how our prayers go. God, protect my family and bless us today. Amen. Nothing wrong with that. But it's very different when you say, God, my daughter is sick right now with the flu. Could you heal her within the next 24 hours? I have a very important meeting coming up at work. I'm nervous. I need your peace. And remember that bill that still hasn't been paid? I need you to come through some way so that we can pay that bill. Amen. Because then when he shows up, you can see how powerful your prayer is. But when we just stay general, it's hard to see how he can come through and answer those prayers. So that's why I like to say, be specific. Specifically praise him for who he is. Don't just say, hey, hey God, you're great. No, tell him why he's great. Next, passages. If there's a specific passage that you're reading or listening to, pray it back to God. Speak it back to him and say, you said that you're my shepherd. I believe that you are my shepherd and you're going to meet all of my needs today. Next one, people. Get specific in your prayers for, your, for people around you. This could be your kids. This could be your parents. Get specific. If someone's dealing with fear, pray specifically against that fear. If someone is dealing with anger, pray specifically against that anger. Tests coming up, whatever it is. Get specific. Because lo God loves to answer specific prayers. But the problem is, we're so general in our prayers, even when he answers it, we don't recognize it. But he wants to specifically answer both. So we need to be specific. And last, problems. What are you personally facing? He already knows everything that's going on inside of you. Why not let him know specifically how you need him to come through in your life? And you'll be amazed at how he does that. Next, relationships. You've got to get in a growth group. You have to surround yourself with, even if it's one other person, where you're going to grab some material, you're going to gather together, and you're going to grow in your relationship with God and others. I have a growth group in my home every single night with one other person, and that is my wife. And guess what? Before that, we have a growth group that happens about 20 minutes before that, and it's with our whole family. What do we do? We grab material, we gather together, and we grow in our relationship with God and others. This is not rocket science, but it is intentional. Because believe me, especially during football season, there's a whole lot better college football games and professional games that are on instead of that. By the way, go Vikes, NFC champions. Anyway, <laughs> you've got to get in a growth group. They're available here. You can go out here on the table. There's a list of them there. And one of the main areas that I want to encourage you in is in a couple weeks, we're going to be starting the series Living Your Dash. Our senior pastor, Rick Hales, wrote a book. This book is going to be the catalyst for this whole campaign. And during this campaign, we're going to encourage every single person to get involved in a growth group. And if you're like, well, I don't have time, do you have one other person that maybe you see on a regular basis? If you do, guess what? You can grab the material, you can gather together, and you can grow. It's that simple. And then lastly, as you're doing these things, next steps are going to come up. I would encourage you, write those next steps down. And then after that, share them personally with someone that you trust so you can be growing in these areas. I don't want to be crude, but I'm just going to lay it out there. The average American spends 20 minutes a day in the restroom. Don't tell me you don't have time to listen and speak. I'm not going to go into relationships because that would be weird in the restroom, but anyway. <laughs> you can do this. You can do this. Some of you right now are saying, he went there, didn't he? You bet I did. Because I'm tired of hearing the excuse, I have no time. You have the time, you just need to be intentional with it. So as you're looking ahead to 2016, what do you want your relationship with God to be characterized by? If you want something on this side, guess what? That's going to come naturally, and you don't have to do anything for that. That's easy. But if you want anything over there, you have to be intentional. It's the only way it works. Growth is not automatic. And if you want to grow in your relationship with God, you need to be intentional about that growth. Albert Einstein's definition of insanity, many of you have probably heard it, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting 
a different result. If you look at 2015 and you did not like where your relationship with God was at, don't be insane. Don't do the exact same thing you did. And then at the end of 2016, starting 2017, saying, oh, wow, I really hope that I can grow my relationship with God. No. Jesus came for the sinners and he came for the screw-ups. But all of us sinners and screw-ups even need to make an intentional decision to say, you know what, I might start small, but I'm going to start and I'm going to grow my relationship with him. Let's pray. God, thank you that you love us. And you sent your son for the sinners and the screw-ups. And people who don't have it all together. And you have created us to have a vibrant relationship with you. One that's not dying, but that is truly thriving. So I pray that specifically for 2016, as we look forward to what you're going to do, pray that you would fill us by the power of your spirit so we can be intentionally growing in that relationship. And God, specifically for those Pharisees that are in our head that want to keep us down and tell us that we're never good enough, I pray that you would continue to remind us that you came for the sick. And so God, as we start 2016, help us to intentionally grow in our relationship with you because that growth is not a given. It's something we choose to do. In Jesus' name we pray.